Thanks for downloading Cross Defense. I'm your host, Pastor Wolf Mueller. Today we take up, it's an experiment. We take in hand Luther's introduction to Galatians, and we talk about active versus passive righteousness. We let Luther do this. If you want to read along with me, you can find the article at wolfmuller.co. You might have to search for Galatians, but it'll be there for you, and you can follow along and rejoice in this great doctrine. Here it comes, Cross Defense. Hey, welcome to Cross Defense. Ooh, ooh, Cross Defense. I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Aurora, Colorado. And I'm going to try something new today. Thanks for tuning in, by the way. Every week we, we want to engage in this great gift of theology for the sake of, well, fighting against the devil. Theology is spiritual warfare. I don't know if you should think about that a little bit, maybe. Theology is that the, the devil, remember how it went in the Garden of Eden when the devil came to tempt Adam and Eve and said, did the Lord really say? It was a theological conversation that caused all the trouble. When Adam and Eve got their theology from the devil and not from God and, and, and things went awry, but it's when the Lord Jesus comes back as the chief theologian, as the chief doctor of the church, who comes back to heal first our doctrine, our faith, our hearts, and then also our lives, and give us life eternal. So when we engage in theology, we're fighting back against the devil. In fact, this is, you know the one thing that the Bible tells us to beware of over and over in the New Testament, whenever you see the words beware, it's being aware of false doctrine. Can you do imagine it? I mean, it's not the Lord doesn't even take the time to say beware of of sharks with lasers or whatever, or, or sort of stuff that we would normally think to be aware of. Beware of paper cuts in the ocean or beware. I mean, what else? You know, there's a lot of things that we're wary of. There's a lot of things that we're afraid of. But whenever whenever we're told to beware in the Bible, it's to beware of false teachers. Beware of a false prophet, says Jesus. They come to you like sheep. Wait, wait, wait. Wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. Beware the mutilation, St. Paul says. That's what he calls <laughs> St. Paul. Ew, man, it'll be good to spend some time with him in the resurrection. The, the mutilation is what he called the Judaizers because, because he was coming over. They, they were all coming around and saying, hey, uh, uh, Paul, you've got to be circumcised if you want to be a Christian. In fact, these Judaizers, they were, they, were tra they were following Paul. Wherever Paul went, then the Judaizers would come around afterwards, and they'd say, oh, yeah, Paul was, he, I mean, he was okay. He, he talked about Jesus and baptism, but he didn't teach enough about the law. He didn't tell you what you had to do. You've got to come and be circumcised. You've got to come and keep the law of Moses if you want to be a Christian. And Paul just railed on these guys. He said, he, he called them the mutilators. <laughs> Can you imagine? You were to listen to the mutilators? I wish they would mutilate themselves. Whew. Now, this is when Paul's breathing fire, and especially Paul's breathing fire when he's writing to the Galatians. This is what had happened in Galatia. Paul was there. We don't know exactly where Galatians was. There's a, like, there's a city called Galatia and a region called Galatia. And maybe Paul was writing this letter to the region. It's kind of in northern Turkey up there. And Paul had traveled through it to help start the churches there. And then the the... The Judaizers had come along, and they had led them astray from the true doctrine, from the true gospel, that were saved by grace through faith apart from works. How would you receive the gospel, Paul says? How would you receive the Spirit? By works of righteousness or by the hearing of faith? So you, you want to go back to being, you want to go back to the law once you've had the gospel? And so Paul's going to, he's going to be on fire as he gets after these false teachers. He says, let them be, if anybody preaches a different gospel than the one that was preached to you, let them be anathema, accursed. Even if an angel from heaven, Paul says, preaches a different gospel, let them be anathema. Even if I were to come back and preach a different gospel, then I should be anathema because the gospel that I delivered to you, first of all, the gospel of the righteousness that comes by faith in Christ Jesus, that stands against all other forms of righteousness, all other attempts at justifying ourselves. Now, that's kind of what I want to talk about today because one of the things that I'm hmm, attempting to do together with you here on Cross Defense, is to cultivate theologians, to grow theologians. That you, if you're listening to me, you should consider yourself a theologian. 
it should not be it should not be that the theologians are those guys up here and we're just the normal christians down here know that every christian is studying the lord's word and studying the doctrine and studying the teaching and that is cultivating in them this love that's what we're after this love and this desire for theology so to that end today we are going to look at martin luther's introduction to the book of galatians now what I've done is I've taken this introduction. I printed. I just printed it out. It's longer than I thought. It's eight pages, and I've post. I've I've taken the old public domain version. I think it's translated in like 1870 or something, and I've updated it and I've put it on the blog. So if you go to wolfmuller.co and you'll see it. It's it, today. It's the first thing there. But if you just if it's not there, scroll down. If it's not there, a lot of goes on the blog. There's like two or three things every day that are going up there. So the new stuff gets hidden pretty quick. But just maybe search for Galatians or something like that, and it should come up there. And you can print out for yourself Luther's introduction to the Book of Galatians. It's it's uh it is his second time that Luther did a commentary on Galatians. It's called the Greater Galatians Commentary. Sometimes it's just called Greater Galatians which is kind of cool. It's from 1535, and it's a, it's a beautiful expert. The whole thing, it's two volumes when you read Luther's a whole um, exposition of Galatians. But this is, these eight pages get you the flavor for it. And this is, this is part of the fun of being a theologian, is, is taking that stuff and, and reading it and, and kind of digging into it. So what I want to do is I want to read some of this. And again, I don't know how this is going to work. Never, we've never done this before, but I'm going to kind of read along and hit some highlights of Luther's introduction to Galatians and then let it sort of throw me off into reflection on it. But my hope, my, this is my whole hope, is that this is going to send you guys to find that and so that you'll read it for yourselves and you'll meditate on it yourself. It, it's, it's, okay to, it's okay to get our theology from, uh, from, from podcasts and from YouTube and from some of these media, but eventually we have to be reading it ourselves. It's a weird sort of thing, but that's how, that's how theologians come along, through reading and through conversation. So that's what we're going to try today, and we're going to do that the whole time. we got an hour, although it's more like 48 minutes, and already we've spent seven of them telling you what we're going to do. So we better, let's just get to it. So here we are. Martin Luther, the, the argument of the epistle to the Galatians. This is how he starts. He says, first of all, it's good for us that we speak of the argument of this epistle to the Galatians. That is to say, what matter St. Paul here chiefly treats? The argument is this. St. Paul goes about to establish the doctrine of faith, grace, forgiveness of sins, or to say it another way, to establish the doctrine of Christian righteousness. Now, I want to pause there and underline this phrase, Christian righteousness, because... Well, like three, hmm, there's like three different ways to head at this word here. Because, because let's, let's point out this first. Because all of us in one way or another are going after some form of righteousness. We, we want to be declared righteous. And, and, and by who and by what standard is a, is a big question for us. Who is, what is my standard of righteousness? Who's the judge? Whether I'm righteous or not, that, that, those are all very important questions. But all of us are after a certain kind of righteousness. But, but, but what Luther is saying is that Paul is, is teaching us a specific kind of righteousness that is a Christian righteousness. Luther's going to go on to say, this is so that we would have a perfect knowledge and know the difference between Christian righteousness and all other kinds of righteousness, and because there are different sorts of righteousnesses. Now, here's Luther's going to mention a couple. There's a political righteousness or a civil righteousness by which emperors, princes of the world, philosophers, and lawyers deal with, so that there's a way of being right politically. Luther continues, there's a ceremonial righteousness, which the traditions of men teach. This, this kind of righteousness parents and schoolmasters teach, and they do it without any danger because they don't attribute to this kind of righteousness the power to make satisfaction for sin or to placate God or to deserve grace. You teach, you know, for example, you teach the kids to say please and thank you. Now, what kind? That's a sort of ceremonial righteousness that we want to teach the kids, and it's important. It's it's part of civilization. But we don't say that you become right by God by teaching this kind of righteousness. Luther's goes on to say, besides this, there's another kind of righteousness called the righteousness of the law or the Ten Commandments, and this is what Moses teaches, and we also teach it, says Luther, after the doctrine of faith. 
So, so, so far, there's the righteousness of politics. There's the righteousness of ceremony or of manners. There's the righteousness of the law, the Ten Commandments. And then he continues, yet there is another righteousness which is above all of these, namely the righteousness of faith. Or, and you guessed it, you're there already, Christian righteousness. Now, this kind of righteousness, we have to diligently discern and distinguish from the other aforementioned kinds of righteousness, for all of those other kinds of righteousnesses are contrary to this Christian righteousness. It's because they flow out of the laws of emperors or popes or commandments of God, and because they consist of our works and they're accomplished by us, by our own strength or by a gift of God. For every kind of righteousness is a gift of God. Now, this is important to note. So, so Luther's saying that political righteousness, civil righteousness, the righteousness of God, all this kinds of righteousness, these are gifts of God, and they should be acknowledged as gifts of God. And yet they are not saving. That's the key. For in Christian righteousness is this most excellent righteousness of faith, which God, through Christ, without our works, imputes to us, is not political or ceremonial or the righteousness of God's law, nor does it consist in our works, but is the opposite. Now, it's, it's the precise opposite. So that Christian righteousness is the righteousness not of works. Like Paul says to the Romans, to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted to him as righteousness. So that the Christian righteousness is the not working, not doing, not striving, not achieving kind of righteousness, but it's the righteousness that comes to us as a gift. So Luther says, that is to say, it is a merely passive righteousness, while the others are active. I'm going to come back to that language, but listen to this paragraph. For in this Christian righteousness, we work nothing, we render nothing to God, we only receive and suffer another to work in us. Now, suffering for us means, like, to hurt. But suffer here, I, I, there's not another word for it, so I kept the old English just because I can't do better. Like the best we can do is receive, but that has this idea of even we're involved in it. But it is to suffer means to sort of to be acted upon, to be the object of the action. So it says, in the Christian righteousness, we render nothing to God, but we receive and we suffer another to work in us. That is, God works in us. So Luther says, it seems good to me to call this righteousness of faith or Christian righteousness, the passive righteousness. Now we're introduced to this language of the active righteousness of God and the passive righteousness of, uh, uh, or the active righteousness of the Christian and the passive righteousness of the Christian. Active righteousness means that I'm doing something. I'm acting. I'm, 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 my will is, is being uh, exercised. I, so I'm loving or I'm serving or I'm dying or I'm speaking or I'm blessing or I'm building or I'm carrying or I'm withdrawing or I'm uh, coming to, to bless and all this sort of stuff. So, that, so the active righteousness is what I'm doing. But passive righteousness is what God is giving to me. And this, says Luther, is going to be the key distinction. The, there are these different kinds of righteousnesses, but it really comes down to these two. There is the active righteousness, which is coming from me. I am the one who's, who is working toward the outside. And the passive righteousness is the righteousness that comes to me. And I am the one being worked on. I'm the one that's suffering. I'm the one that's received. I'm the object of the Lord's work. And salvation comes to us passively. It's the righteousness that starts outside of us. In another place, Luther will call this the alien righteousness of God. Not because it's like in the planets up there, you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> like like it's some sort of crash in Roswell, New Mexico or something. That, it's not the, the alien means external righteousness. It's not, it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to Jesus. And Jesus comes down and he gives it to me. He, he, imp, he This is the, the biblical language. He imputes it to my account so that I am reckoned or considered or declared to be righteous by God. It's really quite stunning. It's amazing. Now, Luther goes on to say, that, and this is tough, and this is why theology is tough. This passive righteousness is hidden in a mystery 
The world doesn't know it, and Christians themselves do not thoroughly understand it. Now, this is so. So, when the world is talking about righteousness, it only has categories for active righteousness, for what we are doing. There's no category in law or philosophy or in this world for a, a passive kind of righteousness. It's only active righteousness that can be understood. But Luther goes on to say, even the Christian has to fight against this because we want to, our flesh wants to always want righteousness to be an active sort of thing, and it's hard for us to understand this passive righteousness. Christians themselves do not thoroughly understand it and can hardly take hold of it in their temptations. We'll come back to that theme a little bit later. Therefore, it must be diligently taught and continually practiced. And whoever does not understand or apprehend this righteousness in afflictions or terrors of conscience will necessarily be overthrown. For there is no... Tune in here. For there is no comfort of conscience so firm and so sure as this passive righteousness. We are always, we're after a righteousness, and we're after a righteousness for the purpose of comforting our conscience. And Luther hones in on this, and he says, look, you want, this com- you want, you want comfort in your conscience? You want, to, you want this balm to settle into your heart? You want there to be peace? It's not going to come from your doing and your acting and your striving and this, all these attempts at active righteousness. It's only going to come when Jesus comes and delivers his forgiveness to us and gives it to us. It's passive that we have to, we have to grab onto this passive righteousness. We have to know this passive righteousness because it is our only peace. Well, we're just getting started with this, but we got to go to the break. Ian there, he's got a clock. I don't know why radios runs by the clock. That is, Ian running the clock is a form of active righteousness. Well, we'll let it be. We're going to go to the break here. We'll come right back, and we'll keep going on Luther's introduction. Oh, this is so good. Luther's introduction to the Epistle of Galatians and the, the different types of righteousnesses and what they mean. Stay tuned. You're listening to Cross Defense. This is Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, and we will be right back. This is the day which the Lord has made. For the lonely and homebound, for the grieving and dying, and for all those who are afflicted in body, mind, and spirit, especially for me. Join us for a live broadcast of Chapel at the LCMS International Center weekdays at 10 a.m. on KFUO. Hello, this is Dale Meyer, and I'm the host of Concordia Seminary's program, Word and Work, an Intersection. It airs weekly on Thursday afternoons at 2 o'clock Central Time, right here on KFUO. Together, we'll discover how the Word of God applies to daily life as we go about our various vocations. Be sure to tune in each week for an interesting discussion taking place at the intersection of Word and Work. I'm Gary Duncan, the General Manager of Worldwide KFUO. We promote our various programs. We ask you to listen to your favorite show. We ask you to support our broadcast ministry, and we thank you for that support. But maybe we don't ask you to pray for us as much as we should. Please pray for the staff, management, radio hosts, and volunteers here at Worldwide KFUO. Pray that the message of salvation through Christ is heard clearly by listeners around the world. Pray that we continue to reach into those areas that are hostile to the Word of God. Pray that KFUO continues to reach those people desperately needing to hear the good news message. And pray that God continues to bless us financially through the gifts we need to continue our broadcast ministry. Thank you for listening, supporting, and praying for Worldwide KFUO. You truly are appreciated. We are the messenger of good news. AM 850 in St. Louis, worldwide at KFUO.org. All right, welcome back to CrossFit. Oh, this is so good. We're talking about we're 
We're we're being crafted into theologians. We're working on this together. We're looking at Martin Luther's introduction to the book of Galatians. We're, if you're just joining us, thanks for tuning in. I'm Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. You're listening to Cross Defense. More theology, by the way, and I'd love to get your feedback on this. I, I really appreciate all the feedback you guys have, positive and negative, things we could do. This is a bit of an experiment. I'm just working through this Luther thing, talking about it, because I th- this is how we become theologians, when we go and we read theology. We want to be digging into the scriptures, and we want to be digging into biblical theologians, Martin Luther being the chief theologian of the church. You can find this, by the way, his introduction to Galatians, at the website, wolfmuller.co. If it's not at the top, like if you're if you're coming in a couple days later, you're listening to this on the podcast, just, just search for Galatians. It'll come up, no doubt. And um, you could print it out. It's like eight pages. It's kind of, it's longer than I thought it was when I started reading it, because I read through it in like five minutes. It's just so, so good. But there is a lot here. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff on the website, too, by the way. When you're there, you can check out the trips, the books, the YouTube stuff, and all the other things that are that are happening. In fact, this episode of the podcast will probably also be a YouTube video, which will be on that post. So you'll be in the – it'll be like the theological matrix. You won't know – you don't know where you're coming or going. Or... Anyway, we're talking about how Luther is uh, – he, ta- he, he comes down to the fact – that while the active right, there's two types of, there's active righteousness, that's what we're doing, and there's a passive righteousness of Christ, which we receive by faith. And the active righteousness governs the world and the flesh and the body, but the passive righteousness is what's going on in the conscience. And Luther comes back as he, I almost said always, as he almost always does, or as he very often does, Luther comes back to the conscience. I remember one time, I would tell you guys a story. I was on Vicar when when a pastor uh, is trained to be a pastor in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. One of the things that happens is you go to school for two years, then you go on a vicarage for a year, and then you go, then you go back to school for a year, and then you get your call. And when I was I was on my vicarage, and and my pastor, uh, my supervisor there would always bust my chops. He'd he'd take my sermons and just tear them to shreds. That's what he's supposed to do. And um and I remember one of the things he said was, uh, "Your sermons need to be more practical." And uh, and I got all worked up about it, and wrongly so, by the way. And so I wanted to sort of prove what a what a great theologian I was by then, you know. <laughs> so I went back to my little office and I started writing a a newsletter article. And the newsletter article was titled "The Gospel Isn't Practical." <laughs> oh man, I'm confessing my sins to you guys here, telling you this story. And I said, I'll prove it from the Book of Concord. So I went and I got out my my Book of Concord. That's the collection of ten documents that are the Lutheran sort of, this is what Lutheran theology is. The Book of Concord is a, it, this collection of these ten documents says, here's what the Lutherans believe. And, and I, I just opened it up and I looked for the word practical. And I figured I'd find like on page three, Philip Melanchthon saying the gospel isn't practical. Of course he would agree with me. Well, I didn't find that. In fact, I found a little line in the Augsburg Confession that said, Clear and practical sermons hold an audience. I thought, oh, great. Melanchthon and the Lutherans didn't know how to distinguish law and gospel. <laughs> that's, what, that's my first thought. But I thought, well, maybe maybe there's the possibility that I don't actually understand this. So I, so I started reflecting on the question, asking this question, how is the gospel practical? How is the gospel practical for our, for our lives? I mean, we know the law is practical. It tells us what love should look like. You know, it tells us not to murder, to be compassionate, to be chaste, to be to be hardworking and generous, to be truth-telling, uh, reputation defenders. It tells us to be content and to be and to be deferring. It tells us how to not blaspheme, but rather to pray and worship and trust in God. That's a, that, that's very. It just tells us it, the Ten Commandments tell us how to live. How? But what about, what about the gospel, though? The gospel, the promise of the forgiveness of sins. How does that tell us how to live? So I started paying attention to these Lutherans and how they talked about it, and it and they came back to something over and over and over again. And this is how this is how then the gospel is practical. Is over and over the Lutherans would say that this doctrine, this teaching of the gospel, really comforts terrified consciences. So the practicality of the gospel is her comfort. The practicality of the gospel is the good conscience that it delivers. So Luther's going to continue. Now we're reading again Luther's introduction to the Epistle of the Galatians. And he says, man's weakness and misery is so great that in the terrors of conscience, 
and in the danger of death, we behold nothing but our own works, our own worthiness, and the law, which when it shows us our sin, by it we remember our past evil life, and then we poor sinners with great anguish of spirit groan and think this within ourselves, alas, how desperately I have lived. Would to God that I would just live a little bit longer, then I would amend my life. So man's reason cannot restrain itself from the sight and beholding of the active righteousness, the active working righteousness, our own righteousness. And we can't, with our own strength, lift up our eyes to behold the passive righteousness or the Christian righteousness. We, we only have this active righteousness. Because, and this, Luther says, is, a, is an evil that's rooted deeply in us. And that not only this, but Satan, abu- this is Luther again, abusing the infirmity of our nature increases and aggravates these contagious, these uh, cogitations in us. So it must be that the poor conscience is more grievously troubled, terrified, and confounded, for it's impossible that the mind of man itself could conceive of any comfort or look to, look to grace in, in the midst of the feeling and horror of sin or constantly reject all disputing and reasoning about works. We just can't avoid it. For this is far above our strength and capacity. In fact, it's even above the law of God. So far, Luther. This is amazing. So that God's law and the righteousness that it requires cannot sustain, the, cannot comfort the conscience, and it cannot sustain us when it's time to die. I mean, we, we might pretend like it is. We did this, and if you're... If you if you watch the YouTube channel, we'd have a show called the Sunday Drive Home, in which I drive home on Sunday and reflect on the on the on the text a little bit. And we had this reflection yesterday: is that there's these two kinds of righteousness. There's a self. There's two kinds of justification: self justification or justification by Christ. It has to do with these two types of righteousness: our works or the work of Christ to save us. And our flesh is simply addicted to our own works and our own righteousness. But it cannot. Our own righteousness doesn't stand up. It can't comfort our conscience. And it can't make a sufficient argument when it's time to die. It just it, it falls short. Now we can pretend like we can. We can, and this is the game that most people are playing. That we we all are in one way or another are playing. We're trying to sort of argue for our own worth and our own righteousness and our own whatever. But eventually, it falls short. It falls short in the conscience, and it falls short on judgment day. Now. Now, Luther wants to make sure that we do not despise the law, the Ten Commandments, or this act of righteousness. He, Luther, when Luther says that act of righteousness can't stand up on the judgment day and it can't stand up on the conscience, he's not saying it has no purpose of, at all. In fact, he's going to go on to make the point that the, that the work of theology is to make sure that the law, that is the Ten Commandments, stay in their proper place. That is, they tell us how we're supposed to live. Here, here's how Luther says it. It's true that of all things in the world, the law is most excellent. Now, that, that, again, we want to hear that again because sometimes we fall off the horse on, on both sides. And this is going to keep us on the horse on the middle. It's true. Luther says, it's true that of all things in the world, the law is the most excellent. Yet, it is not able to quiet a troubled conscience. Rather, the law increases terrors, and it drives the conscience to desperation, because by the commandment, sin is made exceedingly sinful. Romans seven, thirteen. Therefore, the afflicted, I'm, I'm reading some more Luther here. Therefore, the afflicted and troubled conscience has no remedy against the desperation and eternal death unless it takes hold of the promise of grace freely offered in Christ. That is to say, this passive righteousness of faith or this Christian righteousness. This is the only hope for an afflicted conscience, for a troubled conscience. Now, just pause there and say, hey, look. I'm listening to you, uh, Pastor Wolfmiller. I'm listening here to Cross the Fence on the radio, or I'm downloading the podcast, and I have a troubled conscience. 
I'm bothered by my sin. I know I don't do the right things all the time or hardly ever. That the law accuses me that Mo if Moses stands here and he's got this 10-part checklist and he can't check any one of them. I, I'm always fearing other stuff than God. I'm always using God's name in vain. I'm always angry and lustful and greedy and lazy and lying. I'm just, I'm just, the commandments, and I can't find it. And I try. I get up every day. I want to do my good deed. I want to help the people, the old ladies across the street or whatever. I don't know why that's the deed I thought of, but I got to, you know, I want to, but it doesn't work. I can never make myself, I, I try to be a good person, but I know deep down I'm not. And you are right. You and I are not good. Jesus says, call no one good but God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the only, this is what I'm telling you. This is what we're talking about. This is what Galatians is about. This is what this Luther preface is about. The only hope for you, for comfort in your conscience, to settle your conscience, to silence the accusation that's happening in your heart against you right now, now is to hear that Jesus has died for your sins, that Jesus has suffered in your place, that Jesus has kept the law in your place, and that he gives to you his righteousness. That is this Christian, right? this imputed righteousness. It's absolutely stunning. And this is our only hope, this passive righteousness of faith, that we trust what Jesus says, that our sins are forgiven, and that he's our Savior. Now, th this is what we, we have to apprehend. Here's, I'll go back to Luther here. If we can apprehend this Christian righteousness, then may our heart and conscience be quiet. And we boldly say, listen to this. This is, the, the, oh, this is great. This, Luther loves to do this, by the way. Just put words in the mouth of the conscience or whatever. In fact, in a few pages, he's going to have this conversation between us and the law. It's fantastic. But here's what I'm saying is that, uh, this is how we confess this Christian righteousness. I seek not the active or working righteousness, although I know that I ought to have it and that I ought to fulfill the law. But be it so that I, even if I did had it, have it and I did fulfill it, yet not stand, notwithstanding, I cannot trust in it, neither, neither do I dare to set my own active righteousness against the judgment of God, so I abandon myself from all active righteousness, both of my own active righteousness and the righteousness of God's law, and I embrace only that passive righteousness, which is the righteousness of grace and mercy and the forgiveness of sins." Briefly, I rest only upon the righteousness of Christ and the Holy Ghost, in which I do not but suffer. I have not but receive. God the Father freely giving it to us through Jesus Christ. This is so fantastic. So I, so I have to, to embrace, and here's the picture, to embrace the... Um, the, the 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 passive righteousness of Jesus. I have to let go my own righteousness. Remember that scene in um, what movie was that? Indi Remember the Indiana Jones movie? And they're all they they go to the they go to Jordan and they're in the cave there and they're getting the the Holy Grail and uh, and and the girl is reaching for it and she's she has she's reaching for it with one hand and she's slipping and she falls and then she falls into the pit and then there's Indiana and he has to and he's either reaching for this or he's holding on to this you it's this is the picture that you have is that you have to you have to let go your own pursuing of your own righteousness so that you can grab on to Jesus it's that old trick that we used to play you know when someone was when someone was maybe when I say we used to play this trick, maybe I should just say I used to play this trick. Maybe you did not have brothers in which you do this. But if your brother was was holding something and you throw them a ball, and they have to make this decision. I mean, either they drop what they're holding and catch the ball, or else they hold what they and they and the ball hits them in the face. Now I feel funny because maybe you guys didn't do that to your brothers. Anyway, that's the game. That's what's happening here. Here's the righteousness of Jesus. And, and our, so our, which are you? You cannot have both. You cannot hold on to your own righteousness and then also have the righteousness of Christ. They, are, they exclude one another. So, you, so you, you have to either hold on to your own righteousness, to your own, to your own keeping of God's law, to your own doing and striving, or you have to let it go 
and 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 grab onto Christ. Th- this is why, by the way, the fir- when we go into church, the very first thing we do in church is we say, "I'm a poor, miserable sinner." It's like saying all this this big game of being holy and righteous and all this other. Sh- I'm just throwing it down on the ground. I'm giving it up. I'm abandoning hope in myself. I'm not. I'm I'm not going to trust in my own works and my own doing to stand before God on the day of judgment. I've just, I, I have only Christ. L- Luther's going to give an illustration. It's great. It says, like the earth doesn't cause it to rain, nor it does it rain by the strength of the earth and l- the labor and strength and travail of the earth to procure rain, but rather receives the rain as a mere gift of God from above, so the heavenly righteousness is given to us of God without our works or merit. So it's just like the earth doesn't do anything to squeeze the rain out of the clouds. So we don't do anything to squeeze this righteousness out of God and cause it to come down from heaven. No, it just comes. And just like the earth comes, the rain comes down to the earth and the earth just absorbs it. So the righteousness, the heavenly righteousness comes down to us and we have it. As much, therefore, as the earth itself is able to do in getting and procuring to itself seasonable showers of rain to make it fruitful, even so much are we men able to do by our strength and works in winning this heavenly and eternal righteousness. Namely, we, get, we, we got nothing. Therefore, we shall never be able to attain to it unless God himself, by mere imputation and by his unspeakable gifts, bestows it on us. We are the dirt upon which the heavenly kindness of God, the blood of Jesus, reigns. And all we do is sit there and receive it. Luther goes on then to say, the greatest knowledge then, and the greatest wisdom of Christians is to not know the law, but to be ignorant of works and the whole active righteousness, especially when the conscience wrestles with the judgment of God. Just like, on the contrary, the wisest among those who are not Christians are those who know how to urge the law, works, and act of righteousness. So the earthly, the height of earthly wisdom is to know the law of God and the commands of God. The height of Christian wisdom is to not know the law, but rather to know Christ. You're listening to Cross Defense, and we're talking about, oh, this, is, this is the best Ah, we got to go to the break right now. It will be a short one, uh, and we'll be back to continue to talk about this. Uh, Luther's introduction to the book of Galatians. I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, uh, pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Aurora, Colorado, and you are listening to Cross Defense. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Bart Day, President and CEO of Lutheran Church Extension Fund. Every day, our Lutheran schools reach out to children and families with the love of Jesus. Our schools are a rich and vital component of the church, and in fact, they are the single greatest ministry we share that can shape the future growth and expansion of the Synod. And so whether it's a customized loan to fit your school's particular needs or help living out your ministry's God-given purpose, we want to help your ministry flourish and grow. So visit us at lcef.org to learn Learn more. Proverbs 27, 17 tells us, Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. That's why weekday mornings at 8 a.m., two Missouri Synod pastors test their mettle against the Holy Scriptures, certain that not only will they come out better for it, but so will you. The sword of the Spirit is sharp to the touch, but you need practice wielding it. Check out Sharper Iron, 8 a.m., every weekday on Worldwide KFUO. Throughout the Middle Ages, the aristocracy engaged with the Bible through elegant devotionals known as Book of Hours, spelled H-O-U-R-S. The Boone Book of Hours and Psalter features the crests of three noble families, corresponding to the life story of Elizabeth de Boone, Countess of Northampton. Richly illuminated and featuring expert calligraphy, the manuscript and its elaborate ornamentation exemplifies only the Countess's later life. As a child, her father was executed and she was imprisoned for a time in the Tower of London. 
After being widowed, it was to be William de Boone, her second husband, with whom she commissioned the Psalter portion of the manuscript. Centuries later, that same book of hours was put on display in New York City to raise money for the pedestal for the Statue of Liberty. Engage with the Bible, the book of books. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. That's up your host, Pastor Brian Wolfield. I'm not messing around because we got a lot to do. We don't have much time to do it. We are just like three pages into this Martin Luther's introduction to the book of Galatians. This is an experiment, by the way. Let me know what you think. I'm try- We're talking about theology and letting this enliven us. We're t- Luther's talking about, and uh, so, oh yeah, this, uh, you can read this, this Luther's introduction to Galatians 1535. I've, I've kind of taken an old public domain version and cleaned it up a little bit and put it on the blog, wolfmuller.co. Should be the first thing there, but there's a lot coming onto the blog, like two or three things a day. So you might have to just hit the search bar and hit Galatians, and it should come up, and you can read it yourself. Because I'm going to skip some paragraphs. The main idea so far is we have the active righteousness and the passive righteousness. Active righteousness is our keeping the law, our doing. Passive righteousness is the gift of Christ's own death and resurrection, his perfect righteousness in our place. And Luther says the highest of earthly wisdom is to know the law. The highest of Christian wisdom is to not know the law. And he said, this confounds the world. He goes on for a few paragraphs about how it confounds it. And how do we belong to each? We belong to the wisdom of active righteousness according to the flesh. And we belong to the wisdom of passive righteousness according to the spirit. And, and then he goes on. So, again, I'm skipping. You, I can't I can't not skip. We just don't have time. But you guys got to read this yourself. You'll, you will thank me, by the way. Uh, if you read this whole thing, you'll say, thank you, Pastor Wolfmuller, for telling me to read this thing because it blew my mind and it changed my – theology changes the world, folks. Anyway, if you want to thank me, <laughs> wolfmuller.co slash contact. Or if you want to not thank me, if you want to send abusive emails, that's also the place to do it. That's fine. Luther continues. You with me, guys? You guys with me? Here he goes. This is our theology. We teach – how to put a difference between these two kinds of righteousnesses, active and passive, to the end that manners and faith, works and grace, policy and religion should not be confounded or taken the one for the other. Now, both are necessary, but both must be kept within their bounds. Christian righteousness pertains to the new man, and the righteousness of the law pertains to the old man, which is born of flesh and blood. Upon this old man, that is our old Adam, our sinful nature, as upon a donkey. Luther doesn't use the word donkey, by the way. I'm just FCCing it over here. Upon this old man, as upon a donkey, there must be laid a burden that may press him down, and he must not enjoy the freedom of the Spirit or grace, except he first put on him the new man by faith in Christ, which is nevertheless not fully done in this life. Then he may enjoy the kingdom and the unspeakable gift of God. We could write a book on that paragraph. This is f- fantastic. So Luther says, look, you can't, the old man, our life in this world, as we live it and, and in all our vocations and everything, it's just law, all law. In fact, now think about this. The Bible talks to you and to me, according to our vocations, only in law. In, in other words, whenever the Bible addresses me as a pastor, it only has commands. <laughs> That's it. It's all law. Whenever the Bible talks to me as a father and as a husband, it's all law. There's no, hey, if you become a father, your sins will be forgiven. No. When the Bible talks about me as a citizen, it's all law. And for every vocation, this is how it is. As a a preacher or as a hearer, as uh, as a citizen or as a ruler, as a father and a mother or as a child, it's all law. There is only one gospel, and it's addressed to us as sinners, as Christians as baptized so that the pastor and and the and the father have the same forgiveness as the parishioner and the mother in other words there's no distinction there's one gospel that comes to every single person but when the bible is telling me how i ought to live with my neighbor it is it's all law i can be gracious to them but it's not the for, i for, i go and forgive their sins but it's it's not the salvation kind of forgiveness it's the sort of mercy of living together as neighbors now, I don't know if that, I can't see your faces, so I don't know if that makes sense to you, but, but this is the point, is that the, the law governs the way we interact with one another in this life. 
And there's no gospel at all until I come to, to be a Christian, until I'm baptized, until I have faith in Jesus. Luther continues, I say this to the end that no man should think that we reject or we forbid good works as the papists most falsely slander us, neither understanding what they themselves say nor what we teach. They know nothing about, they know nothing but the righteousness of the law, and yet they will judge that doctrine which is far above the law, which is it impossible that a carnal man should judge. Therefore they must of necessity be offended, for they can see no higher than the law. Whatsoever then is above the law is to them a great offense. But we imagine, as it were, this is great, two worlds, the one heavenly and the other earthly. And in these we place these two kinds of righteousness, being separate from one another, far from one far from the other. The righteousness of the law is earthly and has to do with earthly things. And by it, we do good works. But as the earth doesn't bring forth fruit, except it first be watered and made fruitful from above, for the earth cannot judge, renew, and rule the heaven. But on the other hand, the heavens judges, renews, rules, and makes fruitful the earth, that it may do what the Lord has commanded. Even so, by the righteousness of the law, in doing many things, we do nothing. And in the fulfilling of the law, we fulfill it not, unless first, without, many, without any merit or work of ours, we are made righteous by Christ and by the, this, this Christian righteousness, with which nothing appertains to the righteousness of the law or to the earthly and active righteousness. So Luther says, we don't forbid doing good works. We, t we teach how good works are to be done. Namely, that first you believe in Jesus, and by that faith you are made right. You are made righteous. You are made holy in the sight of God. And then, with that armed with that holiness, we, like the rain, come down from heaven and water the earth and do good works amongst our neighbor. The righteousness of heaven is passive, which we have not ourselves, but we receive it from heaven. We do no works. We apprehend it by faith, and thereby we mount up above all laws and works. Therefore, just as we have borne the image of the earthly Adam, so let us bear the image of the heavenly, which is the new man in a new world where there is no law, no sin, no sting of conscience, no death, but perfect joy, righteousness, grace, peace, life, salvation, and glory. So that we live on earth through and we live on earth by the law, but we also are seated with heaven and with Christ in the heavenly places where we live by this perfect passive righteousness of Christ, which is imputed to us. Oh, glory. So Luther says, what? Do we do nothing? Do we work nothing to obtain this righteousness? I answer, nothing at all. <laughs> It's so great. The nature of this Christian righteousness is to do nothing, to hear nothing, to know nothing whatsoever of the law or works, but to know and believe only this, that Christ has gone to the Father. He's not now seen. He sits in heaven at the right hand of his Father, not as a judge, but he is made for us by God to be wisdom, righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Namely, and briefly, he is our high priest. He intercedes for us. He reigns over us and in us by his grace. So that Jesus is, our, he, Jesus is seated on, in the heavenly places at the right hand of God the Father, and there he rules and he reigns us uh, over us by this righteousness by which he prevails before the throne of the Father. His kingdom, then, is a kingdom of this Christian righteousness, the righteousness of faith in Christ. <laughs> Here, Luther continues, because see, he does. I can't say anything better than this. Here, no sin is perceived, no terror or remorse, remorse of conscious conscience. Let's try again. Here, no sin is perceived, no terror or remorse of conscience is felt, for in this heavenly righteousness, sin can have no place. There is no law, and where there is no law. There can be no transgression. Seeing, Luther continues, then that sin has no place here, there can be no anguish of conscience, no fear, no heaviness, 
St. John says, he that's born of God can't sin. But if there is any fear or grief of conscience, it's a token that this righteousness has been withdrawn, that grace is hidden, that Christ is darkened and out of sight. For where Christ is truly seen indeed, there must of necessity be full and perfect joy in the Lord with peace of conscience which most certainly thinks, although I'm a sinner by the law, is touching the righteousness of the law, yet I should not despair. I should not die because Christ lives, who is my righteousness and my everlasting and heavenly life. In that righteousness and life, I have no sin. I have no sting of conscience. I have no care of death. Indeed, I'm a sinner touching this present life and the righteousness thereof as a child of Adam where the law accuses me, and death reigns over me, and at length it would devour me. But I have another righteousness and life above this life, which is Christ, the Son of God, who knows no sin and no death. He's righteous, and he has life altogether and eternal, by whom even this my body, even though it dies and is brought to the dust, shall be raised up again and delivered from the bondage of law and sin, and shall be sanctified together with the Spirit. <laughs> Do you see? So that I ha that this act of righteousness, by faith in Christ, I... Ass I I ascend to where Jesus is, and I'm seated there with him, I, where, where the forgiveness of sins is, where he is righteous and holy altogether, and I'm there with him. Hmm. Now Luther says, both these things continue while we live. We, we have both active righteousness and passive righteousness are both working in us all the time. The flesh is accused and it's exercised with temptation. It's oppressed with heaviness and sorrow. It's bruised by the act of righteousness of the law. But the spirit, our heart, our conscience, it reigns, rejoices, and is saved by this passive and Christian righteousness because it knows that it has a Lord in heaven at the right hand of the Father who's abolished the law, sin, death, and has trodden under his feet all evils, led them captive and triumphed over them in himself. So the faith is saying, I belong to Jesus. He is my he is my king, and I belong to his kingdom, and all the things that belong to his kingdom, triumph over sin and the devil, the righteousness and holiness and the Holy Spirit, all of these things belong to me, not because I've earned them or deserved them, but because I belong to Jesus. I, li I live under him and his kingdom. And when I live under him, all the things of the kingdom are his. <sighs> Ian, I, I, I'm sighing because Ian sent me the note that we have three minutes. I can't believe it. Dear friends, we're on, pa <sighs> we're on page four. We're on page six of eight. We've barely gotten started. Mm. All right, one more, one more paragraph from Luther, and then we'll kind of wrap this thing up. Luther says, We therefore earnestly set forth and often repeat this doctrine of faith or Christian righteousness, that by this means it be, may be kept in continual exercise and may be plainly discerned and differentiated from the active righteousness of the law. For on this only is on this doctrine only the church is built, and in this doctrine it consists. Otherwise we'll never be able to hold the true theology, but by it we shall become theological legalists. And Christ will be darkened, and none in the church will be taught and comforted. I admonish you, Luther continues, you who would become instructors and guiders of conscience, and so every one of you, that you would exercise yourselves continually by study, by reading, by meditation on the word and prayer, that in time of temptation you may be able to instruct and comfort both your own conscience and others, and bring it from law to grace, from active and working righteousness to passive and received righteousness, and to conclude from Moses to Christ. That's the way that we go in theology. Philosophy and earthly wisdom teaches us an active righteousness, a keeping of the law, a giving of our life to serve our neighbor, but the passive righteousness teaches us about Jesus, his death in our place, his keeping the law for us, his dying so that we might live his suffering so that we might rejoice his bearing our sins so that we might be uh, regaled that we might be imputed that we might be dressed with his own righteousness dear friends this is what we're after this active righteousness this this, <laughs> this passive righteousness 
this righteousness of Jesus, this perfection that's brought to us, not by our own works or by our own doing, but by trusting in the promise. And when you trust that promise, you have it. You have Christ and his name and his kingdom and everything that belongs to him. It's yours and you are his and he is God's and life eternal awaits us. So God be praised. God be praised for the passive righteousness which is delivered to us by Jesus. God be praised for the theologians that bring it to us. Hey, thanks for listening to Cross Defense. I encourage you to find that article at wolfmuller.co and read it for your rejoice. Again, you'll thank me. Make sure to tune in next week where we ignite your theological imagination with the joy and confidence of the Lord's Word. God's peace be with you. Defense is a production of KFUO Radio. Find past episodes and support Cross Defense at KFUO.org. Thanks as always for your attention and your time. Pastor Brian Wolfmuller here, and I appreciate you downloading Cross Defense. If there was something helpful in this, I'd love to hear from you. And if, if you can think of someone who might be benefited by it, it's great if you share the episode. If you go and and like and comment on it, wherever you get podcasts, that also helps uh, when you rate it and things like this. So uh, so let us know what you think. Wolfmuller.co has all the different theology, and we will catch you next week right here on Cross Defense.